Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. The show is a proud media partner for the 11th Annual Media Excellence Awards, which are produced by Access Entertainment in Los Angeles, California. The Media Excellence Awards are recognized as the most influential awards show, honoring innovation and leadership in all things mobile entertainment, lifestyle, and technology. For more information on how to submit to these awards, please visit MediaXAwards.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Michael P. O'Rourke. He's the co-founder and CEO at Pocket Network. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kevin. It's it's great to be here. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you guys are doing at Pocket and, and some of the other things that we'll kind of get into later in the show are actually really, really innovative and, and cool. But maybe before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure. Um, so I was born in the Dominican Republic. Oh, very cool. In Santo Domingo. Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. Okay. But at, at two years old, uh, we moved, my family moved to Tampa, Florida. Okay. And for the most part of my life, I've lived in Tampa. I had a stint where I lived in Atlanta, Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, near Atlanta, Georgia for about three years when I was younger. Okay. And I moved out for about half a year to, to Silicon Valley over in San Jose uh, for about six months when I was uh, learning to code. But other than that, I've been in Tampa uh, most of my life. Okay. What made you go to, out to the Valley just for a job? Yeah, you know, I I had uh, I had just graduated college and okay. uh, I learned I had learned to code and okay. I'd been coding for about uh, eight months and I felt like uh, going to the mecca would be a great uh, great place to find a job. Interesting. So, but I ended up back here in Florida anyway. So. Okay. So, what did you take in university and why? Yeah. So, uh, university is, was an interesting um, uh, process for me. Uh, I went in originally studying business. Okay. And um, I actually ended up failing out of school after my first two years and uh, okay. mainly because I played a lot of video games and <laughs> uh, a lot of World of Warcraft it happens. actually and and uh, I came back and I started studying uh, international studies. Okay. I wanted to be a diplomat. Um, oh. I've always been a really big fan of uh, history and I'm bilingual so sure. I figured it'd be really cool to kind of uh, live in a place in South America, work at a consulate or something like that. But the thing is, is I've always been really interested in tech. Um, okay. I've always kind of uh, used Twitter and 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 uh, just been kind of in bead and in tune with with a lot of the bloggers and you know venture capitalists and entrepreneurs and stuff like that. And you know, even from my first year of college, I'd started I I tried to start some businesses and things like that. So I've kind of always had that bug. Interesting. And about uh, a semester, two semesters before I graduated, um, Apple released a new programming language called Swift. Sure. Yeah. And I had tried to learn to code a bunch of times okay. before that, but by, by yourself, or or did you take some classes for that? Um, outside of you know YouTube, you know okay. online courses sure. and things like that, um, it, it was all on my own. Okay. And um, you know, for some reason, uh, Swift stuck. And maybe it was because I, you know, I loved play, you know making like a like a war game app, like a, the sure. card game, and showing my friends or something like that. But but for some reason, because um, I was able to do it on my phone, right? Uh, sure. That uh, Swift stuck. And uh, that last, those last uh, six months or so, um, I was just, I was obsessed with it and, and picked it up and learned. And uh, shortly after I graduated, I, uh, I moved to the Valley actually to, to look for a job. Interesting. So that's how I ended up there. It, very cool. So I, I think like, just to kind of step back for a second, um, Swift, I think is a really good language for a lot of people to learn to code, whether they're a fan of kind of iOS or not. I think a lot of people are, but even if you're not a fan of iOS, just being able to get something like the language is is pretty like it's it's a modern language that was created by Apple not that long ago. So some of the more like languages that have been around for decades can be a lot harder to learn. So I think just for people listening, like if they're looking to learn to program, I think like Swift is one of the languages I think that seems to make sense to a lot of people, especially when they're first learning to code. And then you can move on to other languages later if you choose. But um, once you understand it, I think Swift is a really good language. That's what I've heard and kind of through my own kind of experience as well. It seems 
to be like that. And it sounds like you would agree with that. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, developing for iOS is interesting. It's like it's like a good video game, actually. It's it's easy to pick up, but okay. really difficult to master. Yeah. Okay, so sure. so 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 like with Xcode, for example, um, you know, you start kind of building a really simple app with really simple, you know, drag and drop buttons. You you literally drag, you know, from the screen, you know, of the button to the code, and it connects it and everything, and it's really simple. And you're like, oh man, this is really easy. And you start <laughs> to kind of get into more complicated apps, and sure. and you're like, oh okay. I actually need the code and, and, um, you know, it kind of leads you down that path in a different way than, than most, um, frameworks or programming languages would. So that was really, um, you know, that's, I really appreciate Apple for that actually. And I think that's an underappreciated thing about Apple and, and, okay. and part of the reason why iOS is even so successful in the first place is it's kind of this developer infrastructure that they've built. So I, I, I agree completely. Yeah. Cause they, they used like when the iPhone originally launched and up until like a few years ago, you, I, ugh, the language name escapes me, but like you originally didn't Objective code C. in Swift. Objective C. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, well, I guess you could technically kind of still use it, but they're heavily pushing you to go to Swift. And if you're building something new, you would just automatically go to Swift, right? Like it just, yeah, makes... absolutely. And, and, and it's funny, man. Cause I, when I first learned, I, 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 I was coding Swift for about a year. Okay. And my first my first job in development was actually uh, a job in Objective C. Sure. So so I, after I'd been to the Valley for for six months, applied to hundreds, literally hundreds of jobs, like literally going down AngelList and just applying to every startup I possibly could. I ended up getting a job back in Sarasota, Florida, and they offered to just move me back, pay for everything. I was like, okay, I'm I'm in. <laughs> But that job actually happened to be in Objective C, and um, man, I felt like I was going back in time. 30 years just sure. just from the language um, but it, but it's interesting you get used to the stability of objective c and um with, with swift um especially at the beginning um you just got used to uh the language changing you know sure. quite literally break changes to your code which kind of actually prepared me for, for blockchain development in the first place because i would argue that blockchain development actually moves even faster than <laughs> than what swift uh interesting swift team was doing sure so it's funny how that worked out but it actually just kind of mentally prepared me as a, as a new developer like okay I'm used to things breaking and moving really fast. So sure. that was actually that's an interesting uh, coincidence. Yeah, that's interesting. So walk me through up until kind of Pocket became a thing and what exactly is Pocket? Sure. So so actually, I met my co-founders at that startup in Sarasota. Oh, interesting. Actually. Okay. Like, yeah, co yeah, so like co as a co-worker? Yeah, okay. yeah. So I was the first, I was the first hire and uh, or the second hire. Um, we had an Android developer and I was the first iOS developer okay. and, um, our infrastructure was completely broken. And about a month in, um, a friend of a friend had recommended me, uh, my co-founder Luis. So, um, through a series of, um, really bold moves they made, um, in about two weeks, uh, they sold everything, uh, married their girlfriends and, uh, moved over to the U S actually, wow. uh, to work with us together. Yeah. And, um, so that was Louis Vabel. Uh, Valeria came through a different way through uh, through university. Actually, okay. she was um, she was getting some class credit actually for working at the startup. So we were all there building this thing, and um, in about I'd say November 2016 is when we kind of started talking about uh, crypto in a serious way and started coming up with Pocket together. Okay. Uh, throughout this whole time. Um, we all had lived in the same apartment complex together gotcha. and when they, when they moved to, to Sarasota and I was the only one with the car at the time. And this, the, the, the job was about uh, 25 minutes away from work okay. or from where we lived. So every day for almost a year, um, we were in this car together for, for almost an hour every day. Interesting. So these kind of, these car rides is kind of where, uh, pocket was, was first born. Okay. Um, and in fact, we actually wanted to build something else uh, okay. first. Um, we had this idea of building uh, a telcoin where um, we didn't have to uh, kind of like change my SIM, my SIM card or get a new phone when I was traveling. Yeah, um, so interesting. We had, whole, we had this whole idea of incentivizing uh, people to even spin up their own MVNOs and everything. And, and you know, since I'm on a T-Mobile network, right, I should yeah. be able to go to Paris and go on the same frequency provider that they have over there. Sure. So it was uh, to tokenize our cell phone data and everything like that. But um, we, we definitely realized that that was way, 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 way too early. And really, there was not enough just general blockchain infrastructure to really support that kind of a thing. So we actually came across this problem of this this node incentivization problem, which is what Pocket is, is we're actually solving this idea where 
um, miners are incentivized uh, to run nodes to mine because you know they earn Bitcoin or Ethereum. But um, you can also run a full like archival node. But the problem is, is right now in Ethereum, for example, it's over a terabyte, um, and it's just getting bigger faster. And 99.9% .9 of people aren't going to run you know a full archival Ethereum node to kind of support the network. So um, that's where Pocket comes in, and Pocket's quite literally a protocol to incentivize people to run uh, full nodes, right? So that's kind of uh, how we meandered <laughs> across uh, uh, Pocket. And uh, for, yeah, I'd say for about the first 12 months, um, Pocket was a series of smart contracts on Ethereum. Okay. And um, after we kind of got deeper into the research and, and building Pocket, and, and there's, a, there's an artifact on our GitHub that you can see that's kind of the original smart contracts of Pocket, um, we realized that Ethereum really wasn't um, the right platform for us, okay. um, at least in its current state, because um, it's expensive. Um, you know, our, if we're, if, if, just to give you a, just an example of kind of the scale, um, the person or the company that provides um, infrastructure for probably 80 to 90 percent of Ethereum, um, they're called Infura, and they're awesome people. We actually meet with them um, pretty regularly. Um, in March of 2017, they were doing 180,000 API requests a day wow. for Ethereum. Um, today, they're doing over 10 billion yeah, API requests. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, interesting. So, so, so if you're doing all these API requests and writing to the Ethereum blockchain, you know, even if it's you know every 15 seconds, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you're batching them and everything. That gets really expensive really quickly. So, um, kind of building your own blockchain. And in fact, we kind of went through a meandering route to to kind of building our own blockchain too, because there's a whole bunch of scaling solutions that we looked at on Ethereum first, um, including state channels and uh, this really cool solution called Plasma. And Plasma was interesting for us because um, it kind of opened up an entire design space for us okay. uh, when we were building the blockchain or when we were first kind of you know initially planning it. And um, we actually ended up just kind of specking out our own blockchain as a Plasma chain. And um, we were like, well, why should we even be a Plasma chain? Let's just move it off and kind of make it, make it its own standalone thing. Uh, through a you know a whole series of, of technical reasons, but um, but yeah, that's kind of how we ended up kind of going to to Pocket being its own blockchain because um, because you can kind of build the methods and and everything kind of closer to the metal, if you will. Sure. Um, everything is significantly cheaper um, for for everyone involved, and and it really increases the the success of 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 the the infrastructure just generally, right? So that's kind of how we got there. Interesting. Okay, so I. I want to dive a little bit deeper into Pocket, but I want to also kind of step back for a second and, and talk about, like, obviously, there's a bunch of developers that listen to the show and probably understand everything you've just said. And then there's going to be non-developers that listen to the show. Do you maybe want to give a bit of a high level kind of overview that's maybe a little bit less technical on, on kind of what you do? So maybe if somebody's listening, they could go to their developer and say, hey, you guys should just check this out and maybe we can implement this. Yeah, so I mean, at its core, we just try to make it really easy for developers to build dApps, okay. right? So, um, like for example, if you're using um, uh, an app that communicates directly with Ethereum, right? So that's the whole beauty of the blockchain, right? Is is you don't have to have like a a a, a traditional server or anything like that, right? Yeah. Um, and the problem is is, is the tools um, that most developers would use, you know, for Swift, for example, for iOS, yeah. um, are not nearly as matured, um, not even, I mean, I, like 100, not even, probably 1,000, uh, as mature as, like, developing for iOS would be, for example, right now. Sure. So we're building a suite of um, infrastructure and tools for developers to actually make it easier for them to build applications, and that includes mobile applications and, and web applications as well. Very so, cool. so. You know, at a very, very high level, um, we build tools for developers. Um, everything we build is open source, so um, it's all there on our GitHub. And um, these tools, we strive to make it as easy as possible for developers to actually build these really cool uh, decentralized applications, right? Very so that's, cool. that's really at a high level what we do. Yeah, okay. No, I just wanted to make sure, just so people are clear of that. So for developers, how do they kind of get started um, with actually using Pocket? Yeah, so right now we actually just started building the blockchain itself. Um, okay. So the actual kind of like core client. Okay. Um, but right now uh, we've actually built, uh, before that we've built a bunch of, um, of those tools, right? Sure. So if you want to um, be your own kind of infrastructure provider for Ethereum. So, so you, you know, you see the growth that, um, 
that Infura, this company called Infura had from 180,000 to 10 billion, yeah. um, you could spin up your own version of Infura and kind of as an infrastructure provider. So if, let's say you're, uh, you know, you're, you're someone who works at Amazon Web Services or Netflix okay. or Google or any of these places who, um, uh, you know, are really good at infrastructure. Um, you could right. go and actually um, spin one of these uh, nodes up for Ethereum, and we're actually working with a couple of blockchains now to spin uh, to, to to have those same kind of plugins for those other blockchains, um, and actually be a provider for for Ethereum and these other blockchains, right? Sure. Um, so that's one side of of the thing. If you're if you're an infrastructure expert and you're good at you know configuring things or you know, running your own local servers, um, that's one way to get started. Um, if you're an, an iOS developer or an Android developer, for example, yeah. Um, the other way is to um, build a DAP that's for, for iOS or Android, right? Okay. So um, we built this um, app called the NanoQuest as kind of an example for okay. developers to, uh, to see, um, you know, to kind of inspire and to kind of show people how it is that you can um, use Pocket. But really, it's just um, one line of code um, in your iOS or Android project um, from, from CocoaPods. Um, and all of a sudden, it opens up the entire API or the entire set of, of tools that Pocket provides. So for example, if you want to create a wallet, um, it's it's literally one line of code wow. <laughs> in Swift wow. to create a wallet, right? Very so cool. that's kind of what we're striving to do is make it really easy for developers um, to kind of focus on the app itself or the game or whatever it is and kind of leave um, the complicated blockchain stuff um, uh, to the to the SDK itself, right? So, right. Um, so that's kind of what we've built, right? So um, yeah, you could just play around with, with the SDK and the Ethereum plugin. And um, I definitely recommend taking a look at Banana Quest. That's also open on our on our on our on our GitHub as well. Sure. So I, I want to dive a bit deeper into what Banana Quest is because it, it's a pretty cool little idea that you guys kind of built. So what exactly is it, and and why did you guys kind of build it? Yeah. So um, Banana Quest was born at uh, the ETH Buenos Aires Hackathon um, about okay. two months ago, or wow. two and a half months ago, I think. Or, yeah, close. Maybe two and a half, three months ago, and. Um, we were just trying to come up with a cool idea to build using the pocket tools. So it's like, you know, I have uh, an easy way to um, interact with the infrastructure and I have an easy way to run the infrastructure. So we're like, okay, what's a cool thing that we can build? Um, and we came up with this idea called Banana Quest. And okay. we feel like Banana Quest really highlights um, the strength of cryptocurrencies in general okay. um, and why they're important. Um, because really, I mean, really what, what, what really is what makes crypto so amazing is that you have um, this idea of digital ownership, right? So Bitcoin is kind of the first application of the first blockchain where, you know, there's a finite number of Bitcoins and all these things, right? Yeah. So um, we decided to kind of show that concept off um, building on Ethereum with a set of smart contracts that we also wrote. But generally speaking, what Banana Quest is, is kind of like a mix between uh, Pokemon Go and geocaching. Okay, so, interesting. Um, with geocaching, uh, you basically just go on the website. It's actually a public thing. You can go on, any, on, on the geocaching website if you Google it. And you just get a series of coordinates. And, for example, there could be um, like a trash can behind a bank that some object, physical object, is that you then you pick it up, you sign it, you kind of prove that you found it, and you set it back exactly where it was. So that's kind of geocaching, right? Right. And um, Pokemon Go is just, you know, you're finding these augmented reality Pokemon through, through the game and everything. So we kind of mix that where um, there's two kind of ways to play the game. You can be a quest creator, so okay. you can create these these quests. Okay. And um, what's cool about the app is that it's talking directly to Ethereum. So all the data, um, there's no actual traditional database. Everything is actually on a smart contract and being read and written to a smart contract, which is really cool. And um, you can create a quest and you would have a hint, a quest name. And uh, the cool part is you can say, how many banana tokens do you want uh, this quest to have? Okay. So, for example, if I create a really hard quest, let's say, or you know, at the top of the Empire State Building, and you have to get to the top of the Empire State Building, and there's only one token reward, um, only the first person to, uh, to complete that quest would actually get the token reward, right? Got you. So, it kind of shows the uh, the scarcity, right? And sure. it's kind of like um, this idea of digital scarcity, and um, it's this kind of interesting kind of a token, right? So it's there's this idea of this concept of non-fungible tokens, which, um, whereas Bitcoin is considered fungible, where every Bitcoin is worth exactly the same, right. um, non-fungible is the opposite, right? So, you know, if you're comparing cows, one cow might be 20 pounds high, uh, heavier than the other, so they're so they're different. And you can have that same concept in, in in cryptocurrency as well. So, so each banana token is actually unique and can never be found again once once all of them have been rewarded. Interesting. And what's cool about this is that 
you kind of um, you start to see the real strength of crypto because uh, we have this set of smart contracts in Ethereum, but it actually allows anyone else to actually interact with it and kind of create their own game on top of it. Okay. Um, and to give you an example, for example, there's this uh, really kind of the first kind of explosion in this concept was um, an app called CryptoKitties. Yeah. Um, this was um, this blew up sometime last year, and uh, a few months later, um, and it's a very simple game where you where you just um, breed cats, um, you know, and it's it's just a very simple game. Um, someone else built a game built a game called um, Hyper Dragons. Okay. And um, you can create these Hyper Dragons, and if you feed your Crypto Kitty token to the Hyper Dragon. It actually gets more powers. Interesting. So um, you <laughs> that's can, cool. And, 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 and Crypto Kitties had no say in it. They had nothing to, you know. It's just, hey, we like Crypto Kitties. Let's make a fun game using Crypto Kitties with with Hyper Dragons, right? Sure. So that same concept applies to to Banana Quest, right? So someone could create a quest where, you know, or create a game where you need, you know, a Banana Token, a Crypto Kitty, and a Hyper Dragon to do some other thing, right? Sure. So, um, and it just kind of builds on itself, right? So, um, it's really fun and interesting, and, and it just kind of shows really the power of cryptocurrency sure. um, and, and the chain to, to people and um, in a really, you know, also it kind of shows how, how easy it is to build an app uh, like that with our, with our tools. Interesting. No, I, I think it, it's quite, quite fascinating kind of what you guys are doing in the space, right? Because I, I think at least in, in my experience, and you can tell me your thoughts on this is s some of this stuff gets so complicated so fast that you almost don't know where to start, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. And, and so, um, what the tools you guys are building allow people to kind of get started almost instantly, right? Yeah, correct. So, so it's you know one line of code of Cocoa Pods, and you can quite literally just get started experimenting with it, right? Um, and that's that's really kind of the, the fun thing about it. Sure. So, how do you guys monetize Pocket? Yeah, so there's a couple things um, we're doing. Um, okay. So we're actively reaching out to blockchain. So in the short term, um, we're actively reaching out to blockchains and um, kind of doing SLAs, right? Where okay. where they pay us to kind of build these tools in the short term. Sure. Um, and uh, until we reach uh, until we reach the point to where we can actually release this blockchain, um, at that point when we're running all this infrastructure, we can then plug in that infrastructure and uh, start earning our pocket tokens, right? For 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 servicing. Um, all these applications, right? So, right. so we're kind of acting as an infrastructure provider, um, but in the meantime, we're we're, we're um, aiming for these SLAs with other blockchains uh, because they need this kind of infrastructure, right? Um, as well, and um, that's kind of in the short term. Um, and like I said, in the long term, um, one of our models is obviously we'll actually plug in this infrastructure and earning pocket tokens. But um, really, in the grand scheme of things, that's not really the um, the goal of Pocket Inc. Right? So Pocket Inc. is building. This pocket protocol that is completely open source. It has its own governance mechanisms and everything. Mm -hmm. But um, as a company, um, there are some really interesting things that can be built on top of the protocol. Okay. Um, because what what you're doing here is is you're having a network. So you you have someone running Pocket, but they might also be running Ethereum, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Zcash, and, and a whole host of other blockchains, right? Sure. Um, because they're they're providing the infrastructure for them. Um, so when you have a blockchain that acts as kind of like um, it, it acts as a protocol that that is hosting all of these other blockchains, um, and that that doesn't exist today. And the uh, potential for that is really, really, really interesting. Actually, That's huge. Actually, so this, yeah, yeah, that that doesn't exist, right? So, yeah. so one of these things that we want to build is, uh, for example, you can build a decentralized exchange for every cryptocurrency that's hosted on Pocket, right? So you've got wow, well, interesting, see, a, a thousand. Yeah, so so we can be kind of like. A portal, right? And yeah. and by for as Pocket Inc. being that portal, you know, we'll take some small percentage for being, you know, the liquidity provider and providing that portal for for that decentralized exchange, right? Um, so that allows us as a business to actually make money um, down the road without really, you know, extracting rent from 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 the protocol itself or anything like that. And also, you know, people can compete with us too, right? Like we're building this thing, but also other people can build it too, right? So that's um, that's one thing that we've thought about building. Um, the other thing is. Um, custodial services. Okay. Um, there's some really cool uh, algorithms out there that kind of take your private keys and um, uh, kind of split them up amongst many nodes, okay. kind of as like a decentralized storage, if you will. And uh, Pocket can be kind of like a custodial uh, guardian, right? For, um, you know, you have some person who, you know, maybe they invested, you know, $20 million in Dash or something, and they don't want to deal with, with 
um, you know, taking care of those keys, right? Yeah. So you've got these really big companies that are, are you know, doing it right, like Coinbase and Gemini and things like that. But um, there's a way that you can actually um, host those custodial services, you know, in a decentralized protocol by having a bunch of nodes like that. So um, we think that that's a really interesting um, way to make money as well. Um, and also uh, the third, another third thing that we think is really interesting is um, kind of running like mining pools, if you will, for the okay. pocket protocol. So um, kind of like how it works today with a normal mining pool, you're kind of trusting um, um, your hash power to another central entity and they are paying you out in Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or whatever it is. Right. Um, we can do the same thing for uh, people who just want to earn some pocket where, you know, we make it like one to three clicks to run some infrastructure. Okay. And uh, since pocket, you know, and anyone should be able to do it. Right. So so the idea is to make it so easy that, you know, my grandmother can go go on the pocket website, you know, three clicks and they're running some infrastructure and um, pocket can then or and then they allow us to kind of lend their computing power and we do all the load balancing and all that stuff. And you just kind of start earning pocket as a result of that. Right. So um, and then obviously we take, you know, a small piece of that as well. Sure. So as a business, like there's as we're building this, we're kind of coming up with lots of ideas to, to kind of build businesses on top of the protocol. So that's kind of in the long term, um, kind of how we see it. Interesting. Thanks for listening to Building the Future. This show is heard by more than a million people monthly in over 15 markets worldwide, including Silicon Valley. Kevin Horick's guests are leading business owners, successful entrepreneurs, and merchandisers worldwide. Now, your brand has an opportunity to tap into this dedicated and active group of business people who are looking for places to invest and the right opportunities to support. Find out how you can get involved at buildingthefutureshow.com. So how did you guys fund this originally? Did you raise money? Did you self-fund? Or, or how did you go about kind of getting this thing rocking? Yeah, so um, I got into Bitcoin in 2013. Okay. Um, before it wasn't, before in that, and, and back then it wasn't blockchain, it wasn't crypto, it was it was just Bitcoin, <laughs> Yeah. right? So totally. um, I bought my first Bitcoin in, in about, uh, I don't know, sometime in late 2013. Okay. Um, I want to say August, September, August, or something like that. Very early. And... Um, and that, um, you know, I, I held my Bitcoin. Actually, it's a funny story. Every, you know, you can probably talk to anyone in the space who's had this kind of a story. Sure. Um, actually, when I moved to uh, San Jose, I had about um, something like 25 or 30 Bitcoin or something like that. Okay. And um, I ended up selling it all to live in San Jose wow. <laughs> while I was looking for it. <laughs> so, so I actually didn't get kind of like my lucky break then. Um, what actually happened is when we started talking about Pocket, um, I started really looking into um, Ethereum development, okay. and um, that was shortly after the DAO. Um, so the price of Ethereum was under ten bucks at that time. Right. And when I started writing the smart contracts for Ethereum, I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is the future!" <laughs> so I took everything I had and actually just put it into Ethereum, and I kind of got lucky with that kind of next run up that happened. And um, as a result, I was able to quit my job in uh, the May of next year. Wow. So uh, I had self funded Pocket. Um, up until about uh, January of, of 2018. Okay. And that's when we got some initial seed funding, actually. So we'd raised about um, $350,000 wow, in, in seed great. funding up until now. So, so yeah, Very that's cool. kind of uh, how we, uh, how we've been funded up until now. And, and we're just, we're just going on building and um, yeah, the team has grown from just four of us now to about 14 people. Which sure. has been really, uh, which has been really cool. Um, some people in the part time or full time capacity, but, um, but yeah, it's been it's been it's been a ride. That's for sure. <laughs> Very cool, man. And and you guys did like a retreat recently, didn't you? We did. We did. Um, that was really fun. We uh, so that since the team had grown from from, you know, four people to thirteen people or fourteen people. Yeah. Um, no one had really worked together, right? So half the team is in Dominican Republic. Got, got you. Our, our, my co-founder Valeria, she's in Colombia, okay. and the rest of us are, are here in Tampa. Right. And um, we just wanted we 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 wanted everyone to kind of work together and get to know each other. And um, we've been in a kind of a long sprint of these last couple of months building Banana Quest. Right. So we we did this retreat, and uh, man, that was uh, that was great. We we learned a lot. Um, we've been so focused on product that you know kind of everyone, everyone, we have a culture where everyone's kind of just brutally honest with each other. Sure. And um, we all kind of just learned a lot and, and everyone's just came out of that really, really excited, actually. Very cool. And so where did you do it? A, uh, in Punta Cana. Okay, um, nice. Actually. So, 
So Dominican Republic's a really low cost place to do retreats, FYI. Okay. <laughs> um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We managed to rent um, this big 14 bedroom house wow. um, for about uh, $220 a night. Oh, wow. For about four nights. That's insane. So, so we like, all, insanely we all, cheap. Yeah. Yeah. So we all fit there. And, and man, it was, it was really great to have four nights there. Um, and at least from Florida, it's pretty cheap to fly there. So, sure. um, um, we, we just made that work and it was a really great, um, just kind of bonding time and, and having everyone kind of get really excited about working together. Sure. So, so did you guys actually code or it was just kind of a little bit of coding, hanging out, getting to know each other kind of, or, or how did it yeah. kind of go? So we definitely had some key deliverables that we wanted to, okay. uh, that we wanted to get done. Um, a lot of it had to do with the protocol. Um, those us founders um, really wanted to just get kind of everyone's feedback on how we've been running the company up until now. So um, we did kind of like a postmortem. So everyone was just brutally honest about that. And then um, one of the key things we wanted to do was was kind of um, focus on the next steps for the protocol. So we were almost been ready. We've been ready to basically start building it ourselves, right? Sure. And um, we just we we kind of spent um, half of the one of the one of the days actually just building out or planning how we're going to build this thing out, right? Um, you know, in a real concrete manner with real deliverables and things like that. Um, and we also have the whole marketing side of it that uh, we planned out kind of like how we want to, you know, talk about pocket in the future and things like that. Sure. Um, so it's, it was, we, we really had, um, we really got a lot out of it. That being said, we got to have a little bit of fun too. Uh, we did this fun, like little buggy thing through the caves and everything and, and cool. you know, through the city and everything. So we had some fun too, but, um, we, the whole really point of it was to really get some, um, uh, some key deliverables done because there's really nothing um, like working together like in a physical sure. space. Right? Yeah, fair. So, oh, that's yeah, very cool, yeah. man. So you are obviously heavily involved in the community as well. Um, do you want to talk about kind of the the blockchain meetup and the open code thing that you you're heavily involved in? Yeah. So um, I've been a part of the Bitcoin meetup here for a couple of years now, okay. and I got to give a shout out to, to Gabe and Rosa because they sure. actually started the Bitcoin. Um, the Bitcoin meetup uh, back in 2013, and um, wow. they were running this thing from, you know, there was some days it would just be two people coming to this meetup, but they did sure. it without without fail for um, for every every two weeks, every Wednesday, wow. um, every other Wednesday, um, for uh, even up until today, right? So, sure. um, what happened was last year uh, in 2017, um, crypto really started to explode and everything, and. Yeah. Um, uh, we started to get a lot more attention for meetups and so much so that before we were just doing it at a restaurant where we could pay with Bitcoin and things like that. Gotcha. But we quickly outgrew the restaurant and we needed a dedicated space to host our meetups. And um, at that time, I was starting to, to do Ethereum development and things like that. So I started the uh, Tampa Bay Blockchain Developers Meetup. Gotcha. And um, funny story, I actually started, the first meetup was actually um, an open code. So um, I had about maybe seven or eight people come to it. Okay. Uh, but the problem was that <laughs> Um, and, I, you know, I had been working on our Ethereum project, right? Like Pocket was this Ethereum project that we were building. And so I had a pretty right. decent um, grasp on how to do it and everything like that. But everyone else who came really didn't have a project to work on. They were kind of just interested in, in Ethereum development. Okay. So um, I quickly pivoted more to just doing more um, kind of like demos, like live coding demos and things like that. Okay. To where, um, you know, at, at peak, you know, peak, we had almost 40 people come to our meetups and things like that, which is really cool, especially for, for the Tampa huge, Bay area. Actually. And, um, you know, basically we just had everything, um, all the content and everything is on a GitHub that, that, that I put up and, um, eventually people started learning enough to actually, uh, start their own projects. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, sure. um, about a year later, um, I actually started doing the, the, the open codes where, um, on every other Wednesday when the main meetup isn't, okay. um, people can come in and work on their projects. But, um, I've been doing this now for about a year and a half now and, um, it's been great. It's been really cool. I've had other people do their do their demos, and and, and we're not um, Ethereum only. We're we're pretty blockchain agnostic. Okay. Um, the space we do it at is a space called Block Spaces, which is kind of like a blockchain co work space here in Tampa. So it's really the center of blockchain in Tampa Bay. It's where we host all our meetups and everything like that. And um and yeah, it's been it's been really cool kind of seeing people get really interested. Um, we've got a shoot off of that. Um, Chris Williams, he does this really cool um, uh, Corda and Hyperledger meetup. Okay. Um, which like the the um, enterprise blockchain, Very he actually cool. helped. Build. He worked for IBM actually, and he wow. actually helped build Ledger. So he, he has some really deep knowledge in that stuff. So we've got some really talented people here, um, you know, talking and, and teaching some you know some really cool stuff. Very cool. And, and and a big focus is really you know 
is really the tech, right? Like, yeah. like this is really an engineering and developer driven ecosystem. And um, in a lot of places, you'll definitely see a lot of the interest in trading and making money and stuff. But um, especially for developer meetups, um, we, we don't care nor really talk about any of that stuff, right? Really, the focus is, is teaching people the technology and, and you know, trying to spread the knowledge of, of, of the technology itself. Sure. And I think helping them get started, right? At the end of the day? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's what Block Spaces is, is an education center in sure. the first place. So, Interesting. You know, we have the really general intro meetups and people come there and then they kind of find their place, right? So, for example, we host um, a Mining Mondays, a Trading Tuesdays, wow. a general meetup on Wednesday. Um, we have a Newbie Friday. Um, so it's, it's really... Um, People come to the general meetups and then kind of split into what their interests are after that. Very cool. Sure. Well, I, I think too, even just like sometimes getting your development environment, like you'll get like 90% of the way there and you'll make like one little mistake and one tiny thing doesn't work, but you can't get the whole thing running because like one little error, right? And it just like come to you guys and be like, okay, I'm running this problem because you can spend hours on um, you know, Stack Overflow or, or in Google kind of searching around. And sometimes you find the answer right away. Sometimes it takes you hours. And I don't know about you, but me sometimes just cutting and pasting um, commands in the terminal can get kind of scary because you're like, what am I allowing people to do, right? <laughs> yeah. <absolutely. laughs> yeah, we definitely help with that because, you know, I, I know when I was learning, I was just banging my head against the keyboard yeah. for, you know, hours. You, know, you have to take a break and come back and everything. And um, yeah, we try to be a space where, where people can come and, and kind of get past that quicker, right? And, and obviously, and, and learn too. Very cool. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on the whole blockchain space because I've, I've been in software for a couple decades now, more on the design side. I'm a terrible developer. Um, I, I can code, but not great. Um, but from like the security side of the blockchain side, like, do you think it's ever going to be hackable? Or what are your thoughts um, on the security side of that? Uh, so, so that's interesting. That's an interesting question. Um, I think right now um, we're kind of in a place where kind of like in the 1700s, 1800s, people would be robbing banks, right? Mm -hmm. But the, kind of the strength of the dollar was still, you know, the dollar. Yeah. Um, and, and people are experimenting with different blockchains, right? So sure. um, Bitcoin um, is the biggest honeypot in the world and yeah. it hasn't been hacked. Um, Ethereum um, has enough hashing power to where you know it, it can't be it can't be broken, and they're doing some transitions and things like that. But um, there are definitely blockchains that can be hacked and will be hacked, right? Sure. So okay. Um, what's great about the space is is because of the open source nature. Yeah. Um, you know, and this is going back to my 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 international studies and history background. You know, we've really only tried you know a handful of of monetary experiments or economic experiments at any one time right like we're sure. only really only experimenting one at you know one at a time right like so we're in a we're in this you know capitalism phase right now but but what's really cool is that each one of these blockchains is its own individual economic experiment yeah <laughs> right and some of them are going to work some of them aren't um some of them it's because you know all the bitcoin miners can can change their hashing power to a smaller blockchain and kind of like overwhelm it right um or or you know, you can, you know, in certain other kinds of chains, you might be able to buy up enough of the token to kind of overwhelm it, right? So that's a big, um, that's a big issue that a lot of um, serious blockchain um, protocol developers are thinking about. It's like, how can this thing be broken? Um, how can we prevent this from from really being um, broken in a uh, monetary way, right? Um, so that's kind sure. of the first attack vector that that Bitcoin has proven, as is Bitcoin has proven that that can't be broken, at least with Bitcoin, right? Sure. And Ethereum has proven that as well, along with um, some of the other bigger blockchains. The next step up, though, is kind of like social engineering and kind of like political engineering yeah. within the blockchain itself, where where you kind of have this kind of soft power or influence uh, with people where everyone has their own kind of incentive. And you're kind of seeing different attacks um, happen at that level, right? So, sure. you know, Ethereum is forked, or I'm sorry, Bitcoin is forked, you know, hundreds of times already. Um, yeah. But you kind of see this with, you know, Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin and things like that. So that's kind of like another attack vector where where the, um, you know, you can't mathematically or physically buy enough, you know, computers to break the system. But maybe you can break it, you know, in a, in a, in a different way. Right. Sure. So, um, you know, that's another um, issue that these blockchains are trying to contend with. And I mean, that's part of the natural way of things, it seems like, with the blockchain industry in any way, yeah. um, you know. We're kind of all agreeing to to be in this one ecosystem, and 
if enough people disagree, it's really easy for them to fork and create their own, you know, blockchain. So um, everyone's kind of uh, moving into their space and kind of um, voting with their money if they will, right? So sure. Um, so that's really interesting, right? Um, in terms of the actual space itself, I mean, man, we're just we we're just at the beginning. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it's 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 really hard to comprehend. You know, it's like, you know, the internet was invented in you know 1962 or something like that, right? 1962, yeah. 63. And, and we really didn't get our first kind of Netscape moment until 95, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that was only 50 million people on the internet at that time, right? Now we're at, at you know, several billion, I think. So, sure. so, I mean, Bitcoin was invented 10 years ago, right? Yeah. So um, if, if we kind of see it in a way where um, right now, you know, we work on kind of like seven core protocols or seven core layers, right? The internet itself, sure. right? Yep. Um, and, and there's kind of dozens of competing protocols under there, but there's really like, it's really just seven layers, right? So it's like you have HTTPS and, you know, um, TCP IP and these other, you know, these, these protocols that help, you know, companies like Amazon and Netflix and Google, all these companies are kind of built on top of the protocols, right? Yeah. Um, it seems like we're having a protocol for every, you know, individual, you know, thing from, from money to, to gold, to anonymous money, to kind of like a general smart contract platform, to prediction markets, to all sorts of things. And, and it seems like we're on the way to being, you know, having, you know, potentially hundreds or thousands of kind of core protocols that that we run on, right? Our general lives run on. Sure. Um, as as this industry gets more mature, so I mean, and really, the only ones that have gotten any real traction are just Bitcoin and Ethereum. Sure. So if yeah. you think about it, with that that time scale, um, man, there's there's going to be so many protocols that kind of work together and kind of allow for, you know, these interesting things to be built that we haven't even thought about yet. Interesting. Yeah, it, yeah. No, I, I'm always curious. I've been thinking a lot about that. And it's nice to get kind of your perspective on this that's kind of actually building this stuff, right? Or, or a part of it and have actually done development on an actual kind of po uh, popular kind of um, blockchain, right? And you guys are doing this stuff and then you're seeing what other people are doing, right? So I'm always kind of curious to see where all this stuff goes because you're right. Like we're so, so early on in this space. Yeah, we really are. And, and I mean, frankly, it's, it's like the infrastructure isn't there yeah. to, to really build these really cool things. You know, right now, um, Ethereum is pretty clogged up, right? So, right. so it's tough to use Ethereum right now and, and everyone's working on these big scaling solutions, but you know, all of us who see a future where, you know, a lot of the world really runs on these blockchains, um, there's a lot of things that need to be built before that's even possible. So, um, you know, there's all this excitement and, and vision on on the really cool things that can be built, but it just takes time. It takes a lot of really smart people working on these hard problems, stuff that's way over my head, right? Like I'll sit on a on a plasma scaling call or see it on YouTube uh, for Ethereum, and it's just, you know, these guys are doing some really hard stuff, right? Sure. So, you know, it's a matter of, of time, experimentation, um, finding the right path, finding the right solution, and things like that. But um, eventually, it'll get there. You know that yeah. that you know the you know the, the genie can't be put in, back in the bottle, right? So um, it's it eventually will get there. Um, and you know that's opened up for you know lots of other blockchains who think they can do it better, which is great because that opens up for 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 different forms of experimentation, and everything like that. Sure. And what's great too is that because everything is open source, um, everything kind of grows together, and it's pretty collaborative. Yeah. Where you know someone from Zcash creates, you know, some really great new zk snark technology, and you know, oh, it gets implemented in Ethereum, oh, it gets implemented in Bitcoin, or you know, something like that. So, um, everyone kind of learns from each other and learns from each other too in this space, which kind of pushes it all forward together either way. Sure. No, I think that's that's really great. So, for people that are looking to get into the space um, and and actually start doing some of this development and maybe even try out Pocket. What advice would you give them to kind of just get started and get motivating? Because like we mentioned earlier, I, I think sometimes it's a bit daunting to kind of get started into these new kind of verticals and and we're so early on. But what advice do you give people to kind of actually get over that hurdle and actually start? Yeah, so um, I'd say one of the trickiest things to starting blockchain development is really understanding how a blockchain works, okay. right? So so understanding that, you know, you're writing to this global this distributed database that, you know, when you write this data, you can't control it, no one can change it, right? So so I think the first part is really understanding what a blockchain is and how it works. Okay. And I always point people to Bitcoin first. 
um, learn about Bitcoin, learn about how Bitcoin works. Okay. Um, because frankly, it's the simplest blockchain. Sure. <laughs> it is by far the simplest one. And, um, you know, read the white paper. Um, there's so much documentation and there's so much um, content out there that kind of explains how Bitcoin works at a technical level. Okay. Um, and then making the leap to something like Ethereum is a lot easier after that, right? Where you have these generalized smart contract platforms that allow you to write applications. Um, and everyone learns at a different pace. Um, I would, you could definitely you know, start writing um, Solidity uh, to okay. really understand um, what it's like to kind of deploy a smart contract to Ethereum, right? Okay. And how, wh what it means for someone to interact with it, because it's kind of a, a mind blowing thing when you deploy this thing to Ethereum and <laughs> It kind of sits there forever, right? Yeah. And it's 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 just kind of a weird thing to get used to, and and also the, it's it's you're more developing like um, for a space shuttle where you need to make sure that everything is perfect and secure and safe, as opposed to you know building like a social media app like like yeah, Twitter or something. Or, you know, if there's a bug, you know you can fix it on the fly. You know, one of the things about Ethereum development or any kind of smart contract development is once you deploy this contract. It's really, really hard to change your code okay. afterwards, right? Interesting. Um, in fact, yeah, there, and then there are some paradigms that, that are out there to help kind of upgrade your contracts um, if you, you know, if there's a you know critical bug or something like that. Sure. But it's taken um, three years <laughs> for that to mature and people to kind of really figure that out, right? Wow. So, um, you know, it's it's. I, I would say if you if you're if you're not super familiar with just blockchains in general, first, yeah. I'd say I'd say to just learn about Bitcoin and then learn about Ethereum because those are really the two. Um, major kind of paradigms and it'll allow your your the way you think about these things and the framework in which you approach problems to kind of get accustomed to okay this is how the consensus mechanism works this is how you deploy the solidity code oh, okay I need the ABI to kind of work with the smart contract and et cetera et cetera right so I, I, I that's how kind of I would say you know um, to get started right sure um, if you want to really dive deep into it um, I definitely say look at banana quest um, and take a look at our SDKs because we're also communicating directly with Ethereum. Um, right. And, and uh, Banana Quest is a full stack app. So you can actually see um, from the moment that someone on the phone taps a button, um, you can see through the code exactly how that gets managed and manipulated and actually sent to Ethereum. And how Ethereum actually you know, takes that work that, that you did, you know, mines it and, and writes it to the, global, you know, to the global state of the machine, of, of, the, of the network. And then it returns it back to you, right? So, so, you know, Banana Quest is a full, you know, it's a full stack app where you can see the full process of reading and writing to to Ethereum or to a blockchain, right? So, um, that would be it's actually just a great kind of instructive, just you know, looking through the code and things like that, right? Sure. And uh, and yeah, there's so much. There's what's great about the space is, um, is there's the content is just it never stops, and and people are constantly learning. People are constantly posting really amazing things. Um, you know, the research that's being done in a lot of these spaces are, it's just at a breakneck pace. Um, that's another thing. Um, you should definitely keep up with the news. Because uh, sure. if, you, if you don't, uh, especially with the technical developments, three months off, you're, you're, it's going to take you a while to catch back up. <laughs> so um, for that, Twitter is definitely the best place for that. Um, if you were in Bitcoin back in 2013, really the core place where, where a lot of the conversation was happening was uh, on the Bitcoin subreddit. Okay. And uh, a lot of things, and the, it was interesting because there was a lot of kind of like censorship, and people weren't allowed to say certain things on Bitcoin subreddit. So a lot of the conversation actually moved to Twitter. So a lot of the people who are building anything, actually, every almost everyone's everyone everyone is on Twitter. So uh, it's a great resource actually for for what people are thinking now, and and just generally like what the what the mood of of the industry is. Very cool, but Michael, we're we're kind of out of time, so. Let's close with mentioning where people can get more information and try Pocket out and uh, Banana Quest. Yeah, so you can go to Pocket's website. Um, that's p o k t dot network. Okay. And um, you can reach uh, all of our information through there. You can go directly to our GitHub. Um, it's GitHub dot com slash p o k t dash network. Okay. And um, if you want to try out Banana Quest, um, you can go to bananaquest dot com and sign up for the beta. Uh, we're actually preparing to send out beta invites next week, our okay. first our first round of it. So um, it's been pretty fun. I've been putting bananas everywhere. And uh, awesome. actually, we're going to do a uh, a Banana Quest bar crawl in, in, in about a month Very over, cool. at, uh, 
over in St. Pete to kind of uh, launch the app and stuff. So we're pretty excited about that. That's very cool. And it's B-A-N-A-N-O-Q-U-E-S-T dot com. Correct. Banano with an O. Yeah. So and then it's because we, we all we, we all speak Spanish and we're Latin. Ah, okay. And Interesting. Some, in some countries, um, the way you say banano or banana is banano, right, in Spanish. So um, it's kind of like a shout out to, 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 to Latin crew. That's actually. cool. That's cool. I didn't I didn't know that, but that's cool, man. That's great. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day, man. Thank you, Kevin. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.